In my previous videos, I've been working towards building semiconductors in my garage. However, I have only shown the fabrication process, and I've never explained how semiconductor devices actually work. Now, many videos already exist covering this subject, but they either skip over critical details or they get so bogged down in math that they're impossible to follow. My goal is to create a video series that makes semiconductor physics accessible to the average hobbyist. So stick around and learn. Semiconductor physics from the ground up. Today, I want to start at the beginning and explain how the basic properties of the atom give rise to the most fundamental feature of any semiconductor, the bands gap. Specifically, I'm going to cover the following topics. How electrons behave in classical and quantum mechanics. How electron energy applies to individual atoms and to solids. How energy bands and band gaps arise and how they relate to conductivity. And lastly, how electron energy distribution is fundamental to semiconductor device operation. Semiconductors are everywhere. But most people, even the engineers who design and build circuits, don't fully understand how the devices they use actually function. So let's start at the beginning. Whenever someone says the word semiconductor, they usually are talking about one of two distinct topics, either semiconductor materials or semiconductor devices. Semiconductor materials are crystalline solids, such as germanium or silicon. Semiconductor devices are components, such as diodes and transistors, that are made from semiconductor materials. Now, most of the time, when we hear about semiconductor materials like silicon, we are told that they are called semiconductors because their electrical conductivity is somewhere between a conductor and an insulator. This is true, but that explanation kind of misses the point. Copper is a great electrical conductor, and rubber is a great insulator. Silicon, by comparison, is mediocre at both tasks. But semiconductors have a special property. Their conductivity can change. Semiconductors can transition between acting as a conductor and an insulator. This means that they can control the flow of electrical current, much like a simple light switch does. But here's the magical thing that makes semiconductors much more useful than a light switch. A regular light switch's input is mechanical. We have to physically move the switch to control the electricity. If we wanted to connect a bunch of these switches together, we'd need a device to convert the electrical output of a switch to a mechanical output in order to control the next switch in line. This is called a relay, and they are slow, expensive, and prone to failure. A transistor, on the other hand, has an electrical input. We apply an electrical current to control an electrical current. The input and output are the same type. This means that we can connect the output of one transistor directly to the input of another transistor. This allows us to easily build up a network of interconnected devices that can do useful work quickly and without human intervention. Okay, so semiconductors can switch between conducting and not conducting. But how is that actually possible? Nothing can suddenly turn copper from a conductor into an insulator. And likewise, nothing can change rubber from an insulator to a conductor. So why is it that semiconductors have this superpower? Well. To understand that, we first need to understand what conductivity is in the first place, and to do that, we'll need to talk about atoms. All matter we can see in the universe is made of atoms. Atoms are made of positively charged protons, neutral neutrons, and negatively charged electrons. The protons and neutrons make up most of the mass of the atom and reside in the center of the atom called the nucleus. The electrons have a relatively small mass and exist far away in regions around the nucleus called orbitals. Let's consider hydrogen, the simplest atom, with only one proton and one electron. Because the charge of the electron is opposite that of the proton, the electron is attracted to the proton in the nucleus of the atom. The force of that attraction is given by this formula. Q1 and Q2 are the charge of the proton and electron, and epsilon naught is a fundamental constant of the universe. The only variable that can change is r, which is the distance between the proton and the electron. We can better understand this equation by making a graph where the y-axis is the strength of the force and the x-axis is the position of the electron. Let's fix the position of the proton in the center. Our electron will be able to move on the x-axis. As you can see, when the electron is far away from the proton, it's attracted very weakly, but then as it gets closer to the proton, the force of attraction increases dramatically. The equation is symmetric, so the same thing happens on either side of the proton. There are two things to notice on this graph. One, the force of attraction quickly drops to zero as the electron gets far away. And two, 
the force goes to infinity as the distance between the proton and electron goes to zero. Now let's consider the energy that it takes to move an electron from one location to another. If I start with the electron close to the nucleus, let's call this point R1, and pull it further away to a point called R2, then I am fighting against the attractive force the whole time, and thus it takes energy to move an electron from R1 to R2. The electron gains this energy as potential energy. If I release the electron, it would fall towards the nucleus, losing potential energy. In our universe, energy cannot simply be gained or lost, it can only be converted from one form to another. This means that when the electron falls towards the nucleus, it converts potential energy to some other form, such as light or heat. This works in reverse too. We can raise the electron back up by applying light or heat. So, how do we calculate this energy exactly? Well, if we return to our graph of force versus distance, it just so happens that the energy it takes to move an electron from point R1 to point R2 is equal to the total area under the curve between those two points. In the language of calculus, we say that energy is equal to the integral of force with respect to distance from R1 to R2. Now, this is useful to find the energy, but rather than calculating the area under the curve each time, it would be nice if we just had another graph that shows the energy of the electron versus the position. There's a problem, though. To find energy, we had to specify two points, a start and stop point. That's two different variables. To make a simple function, we need only one variable. Okay, let's remove a variable. Rather than specifying both the start and stop position separately, we will just always assume that the stop position is at an infinite distance away from the nucleus. This is allowable because the total area under the curve is finite. This means that what we are calculating is the energy it takes to move an electron from an infinite distance away to position R1 near the nucleus. If we do the math, we find the formula for energy to be the following. The energy level at position R is just negative Q1 times Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the absolute value of R. This is what the graph of energy versus position looks like. You can see that at an infinite distance away, the energy value is zero. And as the electron gets closer to the nucleus, the energy drops lower and lower. The energy values here are negative as a consequence of our choice of zero as the reference value at infinite distance. This may seem confusing at first, but understand that the whole purpose of this graph is to determine the difference in energy between two points. Let's say that we start with our electron here and move it to here. Our graph shows that we increased the potential energy of the electron by two units, thus the electron must absorb two units of energy to make that move. Similarly, if we start with our electron here and move it to here, then we decreased the electron's potential energy by two units. This means that the electron must have released two units of energy when making that move. Remember that increasing the electron's potential always costs energy, and decreasing the electron's potential always releases energy. Okay, so now that we have this graph, we can easily calculate the amount of energy it takes to move an electron between two points. Now we can use this to explain how electrons behave, right? Well, not so fast. Until now, we've been assuming that electrons are classical particles. However, as you might already know, electrons don't behave like a simple particle. Electrons are quantum particles, and quantum particles have several special properties that govern their behavior. First, you may have already heard that quantum objects behave as both a particle and a wave. This is true for an electron. Rather than describing an electron as a tiny ball of negative charge, the universe sees an electron as a tiny little wave packet moving through space. This is called the wave function. The wave function is spread out in space, and so the exact position of the electron is not known. If we were to measure its exact position, we might measure it here, or here, or even here. The likelihood of finding the electron at any given position is related to the square of the amplitude of the wave function, so the higher the amplitude, the more likely we are to find the electron in that region. For this particular wave function, we'd be most likely to find the electron in this region. The fact that the position of the particle is related not to the wave function itself, but the wave function squared, has an interesting side effect. Here is an example wave function, and here is a graph of the amplitude squared, which shows us where the particle is. Now, here is a mirror image of the wave function, which has the same shape but negative values instead of positive. When we square the wave function, the result is the same graph because squaring negative numbers produces positive numbers. The amplitude squared is the thing we can actually see and measure, and the two graphs are exactly the same, 
So if we measure the values of amplitude squared on the right, we can't know for sure which of the two wave functions on the left we actually have. This will become extremely relevant later. Next, electrons don't orbit around the nucleus. According to our earlier graph of potential energy, an electron with an energy level of negative 2, for example, theoretically would exist either here or here on the graph. Early scientists assumed that the electron either orbited or oscillated around the nucleus at a particular energy value. However, in reality, the electron isn't moving like this. Rather, it just exists at all times in this general area. So an electron with a higher energy level will generally exist further from the nucleus than one at a lower energy level. Next, electrons have something called spin. Now, for a classical particle, Spin would be the angular momentum from the particle spinning on its axis. But, as it turns out, that isn't really true for quantum particles. Instead, the electron just has intrinsic angular momentum. The amount of angular momentum always takes one of two values, plus one half or negative one half, meaning that the amount of spin is constant, but the direction can be up or down. Next, Electrons bound by an atom like this cannot exist at any arbitrary energy level. Rather, they can only have specific energy values. Let's take a look at the hydrogen atom, for example. An electron can either have negative 13.6 eV of energy, or negative 3.4 eV, but it is physically impossible for it to have an energy level between those two values. This is consequential because it means that electrons can only gain or lose energy in quantities that move the electron to a different allowed energy level. For example, the electron at negative 13.6 eV must gain exactly 10.2 eV to move up to the next level. It cannot gain half the energy now and half later. It has to be all at once. Lastly, electrons must obey something called the Pauli exclusion principle. This is a rule that says for any given orbital, up to two electrons can occupy that space, but only if they have opposite spin. One of them must have spin up, and the other must have spin down. If an orbital already has two electrons in it, then any additional electrons that come by must take up residence in a different unfilled orbital. Okay, we made it. Now that we understand some basic quantum properties of the electron, we can get a better understanding of conductivity. Conductivity is the measure of how easily electrons can move. For something to be considered an electrical conductor, the electrons must be able to move freely between atoms over long distances. Let's consider a lone hydrogen atom. We start with our earlier graph of potential energy versus position, and add in lines showing the allowed energy levels. As we saw earlier, if we have an electron in the ground state, we can give it 10.2 eV to raise that electron to the first excited state. Now consider the position of the electron before and after. Did it move? Well, technically yes, but only a very, very small amount. The electron in the ground state is on average closer to the nucleus, and the electron in the excited state is slightly further away. But for something to actually conduct electricity, the electrons need to be able to move much, much further than that. Okay, what happens if we instead add exactly 13.6 eV? Well, in that case, the electron will have enough energy to be completely freed from the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen has lost its negatively charged electron, and the resulting atom is now a positively charged ion, and the electron is a free electron. The process of converting neutral atoms to ions is called ionization, and the energy required to ionize a neutral atom, 13.6 eV in this case, is called the ionization energy. When gas is ionized, it becomes another state of matter called a plasma. Once this happens, the electron is no longer bound to the atom. However, just because the electron is free doesn't mean it's moving. To get the electron moving, we need to input more energy. Let's add a very small amount of additional energy, say 0.1 eV. Since the electron is already free, any additional energy goes toward kinetic energy, the energy of motion. The electron starts moving through space. And here's the thing. Electrons are really, really small with a mass of 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Classical mechanics tells us that E equals mv squared, so if we do the math, we find that the free electron that gains just a tiny 0.1 eV will have a velocity of around 133 kilometers per second. This is a staggering speed. 
an electron traveling at this speed could circle the Earth in about one minute. What's crazy to consider is that for the hydrogen atom, the electron is basically immobile as it gains energy from 0 to 13.6 eV, but the moment that electron gets just the tiniest amount of energy above 13.6 eV, it's just gone. This is important because, as we said earlier, electricity is just the movement of electrons. Bound electrons, like those in neutral hydrogen, take a ton of energy to get moving, and so neutral hydrogen doesn't conduct electricity. The free electrons in ionized hydrogen, on the other hand, require very little energy to get them moving, so a hydrogen plasma is a great conductor of electricity. By ionizing hydrogen from a gas to a plasma, we've changed it from an insulator to a conductor. This is neat. Should we build a transistor out of this? Probably not. For starters, hydrogen gas isn't exactly easy to contain in one place. More importantly though, 13.6 eV is a lot of energy. To ionize hydrogen gas into a plasma, you need to raise its temperature by thousands of degrees Celsius. A device that utilizes this process would be unbelievably power hungry. What we need is a way to move electrons between atoms that doesn't require the immense energy of ionization. Can we do that? Well, everybody knows that metals like copper can conduct electricity, even at low temperatures, so clearly they don't require ionization. What exactly is their secret? Well, as it turns out, Solid materials have some interesting properties that individual atoms do not. Let's go back to our shared hydrogen atom, but this time, let's add another hydrogen nucleus, just a single proton, a substantial distance apart. What is the total force acting on the electron? Well, we know that the electron will be attracted to nucleus 1 and nucleus 2, so the total force will simply be the sum of those two forces. Because the proton on the left is closer, the electron is more strongly attracted to it than the proton on the right, thus the resulting force is to the left. What about potential energy? Well, because the forces simply add together, so does the potential energy. We can simply calculate the potential energy for each system separately and then add them together to get the total potential energy of an electron in our two-atom system. At first glance, this graph doesn't seem all that interesting. It's similar to before. The potential energy of an electron is zero when it's far away from the nuclei, and becomes more negative as it approaches either of the two protons. However, notice that the potential energy in the very center doesn't quite return to zero. This will become very important soon. Now, what about those energy levels from before? Well, the ground state is still at negative 13.6 eV, and the excited state is at negative 3.4 you might notice that the ground state of atom 1 is at the same energy as atom 2, so hypothetically, it would take no net energy to move an electron from the ground state of atom 1 to the ground state of atom 2. However, electrons cannot just magically jump great distances, so in order to move the electron from here to here, we'd first need to give it enough energy, a little less than 13.6 eV, to overcome this hill in between. Without this extra energy, the electron is not mobile and will simply remain bound to the first nucleus. What if we bring the two nuclei closer together? Well, as they get closer together, that hill in the center becomes lower and lower. When the hill becomes low enough, some of the energy levels that were previously separated overlap. An electron in the ground state that gains enough energy to jump to this level can fall back down to either the ground state near nucleus 1 or the ground state near nucleus 2. If we continue to move the atoms together, eventually, even the ground state energy level will overlap as well. Any electrons in the ground state are shared between the two atoms. Electron sharing like this plays a large part in the formation of covalent bonds, which is what makes molecules possible. Okay, so this makes sense, right? Well, not so fast. You see, there's something really strange going on here. If you recall from earlier, the Pauli exclusion principle says that a single orbital can hold up to two electrons. Consider the electron capacity of the ground states of the two separated hydrogen atoms. Each ground state can hold two electrons, so the total capacity of the ground states in the system is four electrons. What happens when the two atoms get close enough that the ground states overlap? Well, the math is pretty clear. The two ground states merge into one orbital with an energy level of negative 13.6 eV. Wait, what's that sound? Oh, that's just the alarm bell saying we broke physics. Don't see the problem yet? 
Let me explain. The Pauli exclusion principle states that a single orbital can hold two electrons. Before the merge, we had two ground state orbitals, each with a capacity of two electrons, for a total of four. After the merge, we have one orbital with a total capacity of two electrons. We've gone from a capacity of four before the merge to two after the merge. This is a problem. Why is this a problem? Well, if we only have one electron per atom, which is the case with hydrogen like this, then it's fine. We can hold both electrons in the ground state, no problem. However, for any other element, this would be a problem, because we would have at least two electrons in each ground state before the merge. When the two atoms come together to form a bond, the merged ground state wouldn't have enough capacity for the extra electrons, and some electrons would need to move up to the next energy level in order to not violate the Pauli exclusion principle. Moving the electrons up requires energy, and so forming the covalent bond would result in a higher energy state than before. This would make the covalent bond unstable, and the bond could break at any time and release a bunch of energy. Essentially, all covalently bonded molecules would be bombs ready to explode at any time. Reality check here. Molecules are all around us. The air we breathe consists mostly of nitrogen and oxygen molecules. Has the air around you exploded yet? No? then it must be the case that the covalent bonds are more stable than the constituent atoms. This implies that the formation of covalent bonds must result in a lower energy state than the two independent atoms. So what's the problem? Well, when a mathematical model doesn't agree with observation, then the model must be incomplete. So what are we missing here? Well, remember when we were first discussing the quantum properties of the electron? I said that the electron is fundamentally a wave function, but the position of the electron is related to the wave function squared, which means that for a given electron position, it can have two different possible wave functions, positive or negative. This fact is about to have a very profound impact on our reality. Let's say we have two electrons, both with positive wave functions. When we bring the two electrons together, their wave functions begin to overlap. When wave functions overlap, they add together. I'm showing the original two wave functions as dull red lines, and the bright red line is the sum. In this case, when the two wave functions sum together, their amplitudes add in the center. But there's another possibility. Suppose the first electron wave function is positive, but the second is negative. When these two come together, the result is different than before. The two wave functions sum together, and the center cancels out. Now let's add the amplitude squared graphs for the case where the wave functions are both positive. Remember that amplitude squared shows the probability an electron is found at a particular location. You can see that as the wave functions come together, the probability of the electron being closer to the center gets larger and larger. In the case where one wave function is positive and one is negative, as the wave functions come together, we can see that the probability of an electron being in the center is substantially lower than it being further away. It's worth restating that we cannot measure the amplitude of the wave function directly. Instead, we can only measure the location of the electron, or the wave function squared. This means that in both cases, the two systems start out looking exactly the same. It's only when the two orbitals merge that we can infer whether the underlying wave functions are identical or opposite. Now, what can we say about the potential energy of the electrons in each of the two cases? Well. We know that the energy level of the electron is higher the further away the electron is from the nuclei at the center. When we started, the electron location was the same in both cases, so the potential energy was the same as well. However, after the electrons come together, there is a difference. For case 1, the electron is very likely to be in a central location, which means that the electron has a lower energy level. For case 2, the electron is more likely to be outside the central region, and thus the energy level is higher than in the first case. What's crazy is that the orbitals started out with the same energy level, but as they merged, they split into two different energy levels. We call the lower energy level the bonding orbital, and the higher energy level the antibonding orbital. So does this fix our problem with electron capacity? Well, before the merge we had two orbitals, and a total capacity of four electrons. Now, after the merge, we have two orbitals and a total capacity of four electrons. This means that we are no longer violating the Pauli exclusion principle. Phew! And here's the best part. Remember how the bonding orbital is at a lower energy level than the orbitals of the individual atoms? This means that in order to break a covalent bond, we must input a small amount of energy or else the bond won't break. 
This shows that covalent bonds are more stable than atoms are by themselves, which explains why molecules in the air aren't constantly exploding all around you. If all that makes your head spin, don't worry, you're not alone. This field of study is known as molecular orbital theory and has been the subject of many Nobel Prizes in the last century. All you really need to understand here is that the energy levels of the orbitals will split when atoms come together. So now that we understand the basics of molecular orbital theory, let's fix our earlier model. Now, when two atoms come together, the two ground states split into the two separate orbitals described by molecular orbital theory. This split is small, but relevant. And here's the really cool part. The energy level splitting happens each time you add a new atom. If we double the number of atoms, then we double the number of energy levels. As the number of energy levels becomes greater, the separation between those energy levels becomes finer and finer. Remember that atoms are so small that even a tiny, microscopic piece of solid material can contain billions and billions of atoms. With that number of atoms, the individual energy levels are so closely spaced that the distance between two adjacent energy levels is basically zero. At this point, it no longer looks like distinct levels, but instead a continuum that we call an energy band. For macroscopic materials, it's no longer useful to specify the properties of a single electron or individual energy level. Instead, we condense everything down to only the most relevant values, the energy band occupancy and the band gap. So what is occupancy? Well, it's a measure of how many electrons are in an energy band versus the total electron capacity of that band. Remember that in a single atom, electrons fill the lowest available orbital first. Once that fills, we move to the next orbital, and so on until we reach our total number of electrons. This is similar for solid materials. In a solid material, we have n total electrons. Each electron in our system fills in the lowest available energy level in the lowest band first, and eventually, the first band fills up entirely. Then, the next band begins filling, and so on until we run out of electrons. Because the bands fill from the bottom up, the lower bands are all full, and the upper bands are all empty. The only band that is relevant is the highest occupied energy band. This band will either be totally full or partially full. If the band is only partially full, then any electrons in that band only need a small amount of energy to jump up to an unoccupied orbital. And remember, orbitals of this energy level are all throughout the material, so jumping to this energy level also comes with it a substantial change in the position of the electron. This means that the electron only needs a very small amount of energy to move between atoms. This means that any material with a partially filled band is a conductor of electricity. This finally explains why metals like copper can conduct electricity without requiring ionization energy. What if the highest occupied energy band is totally full? Well, in that case, any electrons in that band are stuck in place unless they receive enough energy to jump up to the next available orbital. Where is the next orbital? Well, it's all the way up here in the next band. In order for an electron to move around, it needs to receive enough energy to jump the gap between the two energy bands. We call this gap, obviously enough, the band gap. In most materials, the band gap is large, and so it takes a large amount of energy to move an electron to the next band. Because of this, the electrons are stuck in place and the material does not conduct electricity. Any material like this with a large band gap is an insulator. Semiconductors are like insulators, but instead of the next band being 10 eV up, it's only about 1 eV up instead. Okay, so what? Big deal. It's still an insulator, right? Well, not so fast. Remember that all atoms have thermal energy as long as their temperature is greater than absolute zero. This thermal energy is energy that is available to the electrons. The thermal energy can transfer to the electrons and cause them to gain and lose potential energy themselves. The transfer is random, but follows a precise relationship. This is the Fermi-Dirac distribution. It's one of the most fundamental equations of solid-state physics, and it tells you the probability of an electron gaining a particular amount of energy at a particular temperature. I'm going to go into this equation in a lot more detail in a future video, but for now what is relevant is that the variable for temperature resides inside an exponential. What this means is that the number of electrons that have enough energy to jump the gap and contribute to electrical conduction changes sharply with temperature. At low temperature, virtually zero electrons have enough energy to jump the gap, and the material is an insulator. At high temperatures, tons and tons of electrons have enough energy to jump the gap, and the material is a conductor. At room temperature though, a small but non-zero number of electrons can gain enough energy to jump a 1 eV gap. 
Because the Fermi-Dirac relationship is exponential, a small increase in temperature can increase the number of conducting electrons by a huge amount, dramatically increasing the conductivity of the material. And conversely, a small decrease in temperature will cut the number of conducting electrons by a huge factor as well, dramatically increasing its resistance. This exponential temperature dependence of conductivity is at the heart of what makes semiconductor devices function. Semiconductor devices operate by taking advantage of this relationship between temperature and electron energy. However, they don't change conductivity by changing their temperature directly. Instead, they create an energy barrier between their input and output terminals. Electrons cannot jump the barrier unless they have enough energy to do so. The height of this barrier is dependent on an input voltage. Remember that the Fermi-Dirac distribution says that at room temperature, we have very few high energy electrons, some medium energy electrons, and a lot of low energy electrons. At room temperature, with zero input voltage, it is extremely rare for an electron to have enough energy to jump the barrier, and so the device does not conduct electricity. As the input voltage rises, the barrier drops, and the small number of electrons with the highest energy can cross the gap. If we raise the input voltage more, the barrier drops more, and all the medium energy electrons can cross as well. Eventually, the voltage will be high enough and the barrier low enough that the massive number of low energy electrons can cross too. This explains why many devices such as diodes and transistors have an exponential relationship between voltage and current. It's specifically because of the Fermi-Dirac equation. It's also the reason why semiconductor devices have to be kept cool. When the temperature gets too high, Electrons can cross the barrier without any additional input voltage, and the switching devices basically get stuck on. Finally, we have arrived at today's destination. Now we understand exactly what a semiconductor is, the quantum properties that create the band gap, and the fundamental mechanism that allows semiconductor devices to function. I think this is a good enough place to end for now. In the next video, I'll dive into semiconductor devices in a lot more detail, and more thoroughly explain Fermi-Dirac, energy barriers, as well as doping and how to construct real devices. In the meantime though, I hope this video has given you a cursory understanding of some basic semiconductor physics. I really appreciate you sticking through all the way to the end. This is my first time animating anything ever, and hopefully it kept the video engaging at the very least. Feel free to let me know what you thought of this video, or ask any questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you like this content and want me to keep making videos like this, consider supporting me on Patreon. Link in the description. For now, I'll see you later.